Thank you, Robin. We go back a long way. Robin is a very close friend of the family and is over here on holiday from good old New Zealand and venturing up to Thursday Island, but decided to spend some time with her dearest friend, my wife, Maisel. And we thank you, Robin. Thank you for making the trip. Actually, I have to thank Robin for much. You know, I wouldn't be preaching here today if it wasn't for her. Who many years ago, in my dark moments, encouraged me back to church. Encouraged me back to church. And so, yes, Robin, thank you and God bless you. Today, today we're going to present to you a perfect picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it comes from the book of Revelation. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. It's there to help you to see Jesus Christ in all his glory, in all his fullness, and completely understand what he is about. We've been looking through the book of Daniel, and there has been much said in the book of Daniel. But we need to go to the book of Revelation to understand what it is that the book of Daniel means and how it helps us in our time. As I presented you the book of Daniel, I helped you to understand why the book of Daniel is there. And yes, prophecy is an important part of it. But the most significant message that comes out of the book of Daniel is that God is in control. That God is in control of the now and the future. And he has plans and he's revealed those plans to us. But it's through the book of Revelation that we get the greater understanding of all of that. But without Jesus, that means nothing. And so the greatest and the most important message that comes out of the book of Revelation is an understanding of Jesus Christ. And I want to give you that presentation. I want to help you to know this morning that in the book of Revelation you meet and you get an understanding of the perfect picture of Jesus Christ. It is, after all, called the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. It's a revelation, not of the beast, not of apostasy, although it's there. The book of Revelation primarily is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And as the revelation of Jesus Christ is given to us, we get to understand God's final message. But what would the final message be if Jesus were not part of it? Jesus is the center. He's the pivotal point of the book of Revelation. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Notice what? Which God gave. Okay. This is not our interpretation of Jesus. If it was up to me to tell you about Jesus, I'm sure I would say something very different than what God is, would say. And so this, as we look into the book of Revelation, it's a picture of how God sees Jesus. And that's a very important to us, that we see Jesus in the right way. It's which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. So Jesus is involved in the events that are to take place. Okay? They're not going to happen without Jesus. Jesus is the center of all things that will happen. Notice it says he sent it and he signified it by his angels. Heavenly messengers endorsed the message of God. All of heaven is focused on this understanding of Jesus Christ and he trusted it to a human being. He trusted John with the message that was being relayed to us from heaven. 
God sent it. God gave it. It's about Jesus. The angels endorsed it, and John recorded it. As simple as that. That's what the book of Revelation is about. And this is its driving focus. It is a revelation of hope. Because only in Jesus Christ can you have hope. It's the key to help us to understand how we attain all of that. It's a revelation of hope. And so it's that great key that unlocks for us the future. Now, I have up here a couple of bookends. Okay? A couple of bookends. And between them, we've got a few books. Well, today, that is an illustration of the book of Revelation. That is an illustration of the book of Revelation. Because there are, within the book of Revelation, bookends. And you always have one bookend on the left and you have a bookend on the right. One bookend's no good on its own. Okay? Now, when you open the book of Revelation, you are introduced to a bookend. Something that gives a solid, upright means of holding something together. And... You then have another bookend at the end of the book of Revelation. It's between those bookends that all the relevant information is given. Now, I want to introduce to you the the bookends that lock the book of Revelation together. I want you to come to Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. This is where you are introduced to the first theme. After we are told that the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ, we are told something very beautiful. Okay? We are told something very beautiful. And this is what we are told in Revelation 1 verse 3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it. Hey! God, after he has said, or the servant after he has said that the book of Revelation is about Jesus Christ, it's about blessings. Okay? The book of Revelation is a book of blessings to you, to God's people. That's what he says. Blessed are those who read, those who understand. But then look what he says next. At the end of the book, In almost the last verses of the book of Revelation, we get the other bookend. The first bookend is, we will be blessed by God. The second bookend is, we will be cursed if we don't listen to the words of God. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues, that are written in the book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. And this is God's way of saying, the information that I am going to share with you in the book of Revelation is the most important message I can tell any human being. You will be blessed if you listen. You will be cursed if you don't. Listen to what? All the stuff in between. Everything between verse 3 of chapter 1 and verse 18 of chapter 22 is for you to pay attention to. It's the most important message in the whole of Scripture is what happens in this book because it's about the end of time. All the other stuff in the Bible that we've got is historical. Some of the book of Revelation is historical, but there is still a main event. There is still a main event, and look at it here. Revelation 1 verse 7, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Book end. Number two, Behold, he is coming. Look now at the next text that I show you. We go again to chapter 22 
And what does it say? And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Bookend number two of the second bookends is that Jesus says himself, I will come quickly. Everything in between is relevant to the coming of Christ, is relevant to the second coming of Christ. Chapter 1, the angel, the messenger of God, said Jesus will come, every eye will see him. Jesus, as the book is closed off, says, behold, I come quickly. The book of Revelation is about how God wants to bless you through the second coming of Christ. That's it in a nutshell. Go looking for other stuff, and you're dealing in the minor matters. The major message of the book of Revelation is that God wants to bless you through the second coming of Christ. You don't pay attention to those messages, you're not going to receive the blessings that come through the second coming of Christ. So it all is pivotal on understanding Jesus, knowing Jesus. And the book of Revelation helps us to understand Jesus like no other book of the Bible does. No other book of the Bible tells us the picture of Jesus like the book of Revelation. The Gospel of John goes on a special focus to present Jesus as God, divine. The Gospels tell the story of his acts of ministry. But no gospel tells you the complete story of Jesus like the book of Revelation. And I'm just going to briefly, I'm just going to briefly today help you to understand and to know the Jesus of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is also about prophecy. And that was my focus of the book of Revelation. Uh, through the, my, my focus of the study of the book of Daniel was that we get to know God and we get to trust God because of, revel of prophecy, okay? How prophecy gives us the endorsement of who God is. Fulfilled Bible prophecy verifies the truthfulness of God's word and gives us confidence that the future is in his hand. Somebody else made that, not me. But that's, that's the ratio that they had calculated. That there's something like 800 prophetic verses in the Bible. 90% are already filled. 10% thereabouts are left to happen. That 10% are mostly are all relevant to the second coming. Nearly everything else has taken place and has happened. Amos said to us in Amos 3 verse 7, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So let's have a look at Jesus from the book of Revelation. If you've got the Bible there, you can open it to us, because I don't have these texts on the screen. But one of the first things we learn, after we've been given the introduction from verses 1 to 7, we then get to learn and know more of Jesus. Come to chapter 1 of the book of Revelation. This, this, this little phrase, Alpha and Omega, is more important than you think. Okay? Because when you look at the book of Revelation chapter 1, notice how many times this phrase or similar appears. It appears many times. Verse 8. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Okay? So it's there in verse 8, okay? If you carry on in that verse, it also says he's the beginning and the end. If you go down to verse 11, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega. It says, I am the first and the last. You cross over to verse 17. It says, I am the first and the last. This is perhaps the most important thing that you need to know about Jesus Christ is that he's always there. 
There has never been a time when Jesus has not been there. He was there before this world began. That saves you from developing the thoughts that at some point he was created. At some point he was not equal with God. Jesus is all things God. This, this little phrase is one of the most important safety nets in the book of Revelation. You lose the thought of that and the meaning of that and Jesus fades, fades, fades and becomes less significant in people's lives. And this is one of the most important things the Bible wants us to know. That Jesus, in the book of Revelation, he is the beginning and the end. Book of Hebrews says he's the author and the finisher. And this is something that we must hold on to right through to the end of time. Christ should never at any point be devalued. But he is. There are many approaches being made to devalue the significance of, of Jesus Christ. We must guard against it. This next one, the book of Revelation presents to us Jesus as the light of the world. When you read and you dig into Revelation chapter 1, you've got these seven lampstands. But who's in the midst of them? Christ. Christ is the light of those lampstands. Christ is the light of the world. Christ is the light of the church. And when you look into the message of the seven churches, those who hold on to the light of Christ are blessed. But as they turn out the light of Christ and accept the teachings of man, they go into darkness. Jesus is the one we need to hold up as the light of of the world. Just look at verse 5 of chapter 1. A beautiful phrase here. And from Jesus Christ, the what? The faithful witness. Yeah, he's the faithful witness. The one we can trust. There is no doubt when we accept that Christ is the light of the world and the one who can show us the way the one who can set before us a pathway. I love this next one. I love this next one where Jesus is Revelation's all-powerful creator. All-powerful creator. And you find that message strong in the message to the seven churches. The message to the seven churches is where he, he, he shows to them that he is the one who is there and has taken care of these people. Have a look at verse 15 of chapter 1 just for a moment. Verse 15, his feet were like fine brass as if refined in a furnace and his voice is the sound of many waters. Okay, there's a verse that is describing to us Jesus Christ. Come across now to chapter 5. Come across now to chapter, sorry, chapter 4. Chapter 4. And we get this picture. Come to verse 2 of chapter 4. Immediately I was on the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. There was a rainbow about the throne and its appearances like emerald. And as you read that little passage, you're given a description of God. Back in chapter 1, it was a description of Jesus Christ. God and Jesus are one and the same. Jesus Christ is the all-powerful creator. He's on par with God. He's not subject to God. He's on par with God. And we need to believe that. We need to know that, that Jesus is our all-powerful creator. Come across to Revelation chapter 17, verse 14. There's a phrase that is used here. 
And when it's talking about Jesus Christ, it says in verse 14 of chapter 17, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is what? The Lord of lords and the King of kings. He is the Almighty, the Great One. You know, this is how the book of Revelation ends. The book of Revelation ends in the same way that the Bible begins. There is no difference. There is no difference. There is no change in the way that the Bible expresses and teaches us things about God. But many people in the world today modify Jesus Christ and put him in a different role, put him in a different capacity. Oh no, John the Revelator was told that Jesus is the unchangeable, the unchangeable, the one who never changes. Let's have a look at a couple more points. And this, to me, this is the most beautiful one. This is the most beautiful. While I was pastoring at Mwollumbar, I was part of the, the minister, minister's fraternal. And once a month, um, once a year, every church got to host all of the other churches and take a worship service and give everybody a meal. So the first time it's my turn, I thought, what am I going to share to these people? How am I going to reach the heart of these people and introduce them to the book of Revelation? And I preached that subject, the Lamb of God from the book of Revelation. And they sat there spellbound. And the next year it came around. And I thought, okay, I'm going to stick with the book of Revelation. And I preached what worship looks like in the book of Revelation. Opened up to them, Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Wow. They, they, they were just, oh, could not comprehend that Revelation was such a beautiful book. And then the third year, I thought, okay, I'm going to seize the opportunity. And I preached the subject, Revelation and the second coming. And they said to me, we're going to go home and study the book of Revelation. There was one lady there who was doing a PhD on the book of Revelation. And she came to me and she says, can I please have the source material from which you all borrowed that? Because I'm going to need it for my PhD. Wow. That, that are powerful message. But this is, the, this is the most important one. This is the one that drives the whole of the book of Revelation. Meeting the lamb in the book of Revelation. Meeting the lamb that was slain. Remember, the author of the book of Revelation is the one who wrote down what John the Baptist said when Jesus came. Behold, the lamb of God. John, the one who wrote the book of Revelation, was there. And he recorded what was thought of about Jesus then. And so when you come to the book of Revelation, that is our book for, the, for these times, he focuses on the Lamb. The Lamb is the center of the book of Revelation. Not the beast. Not 666. It's the Lamb. You have a look in the center of Revelation chapter 14. The lamb is mentioned in the book of Revelation in the three angels' message. The lamb is the center of the book. Let's have a look at Revelation 1 verse 5 again. Let's have a look at Revelation 1 verse 5. And it says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, what? To be dead, he had to be killed, didn't he? He had to be slain. So right in the beginning of the book of Revelation, you're getting introduced to the one who was dead, the lamb that was slain. And then as you step into the book of Revelation chapter 5, 
Look at verse 6 of Revelation chapter 5. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. The lamb that was slain. Come to verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, for you were slain. The lamb that died, the one that was slain, is worthy to continue the work of God. Verse 12 of the same chapter. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory. Oh, the one who died as a sacrificial lamb is the one that is worthy. No one else. No man that dreams up and thinks I'm Jesus Christ. You know, there's people walking the planet now that believe they're Jesus Christ. First question you want to have for them is when did you die and when did you rise up again? And if they can't say, well, I died and I'm now alive, they're not Jesus Christ. They are not Jesus Christ. Have a look at Revelation 7, verse 17. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God, the Lamb, Jesus never stops being the Lamb. Never stops being the Lamb. It's through the sacrifice of him as the lamb that all things have its purpose and its meaning. Oh, this is a powerful subject that we get to see Jesus as the dying lamb, the one that was slain. Oh, look at this one. We want to know we're in good hands when we're in trouble, don't we? You know, I'm not sure if there's many lawyers out there that we could trust when we have a complicated, difficult situation. But I want to tell you, as we step into the future, we can have every confidence in Jesus Christ because he is a righteous judge. Just come to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And as you come into chapter 2, look, look at verse 2 of chapter 2. Jesus is the, the one who's watching over the seven churches, says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil. And so here is Jesus looking over the churches, and he says, I know your works. And to all of those churches, he says, you've got a problem, but your solution is in me. I will fix your problem. And to each one of those seven churches, he gives them a message of instruction that will remove their difficulty, remove their obstacle, and set them safely in the presence of a righteous father because he's the righteous judge. He, he knows us. He knows what our need is. And as you look at the messages to the seven churches, particularly the one relevant to us, what does he say? Oh, you are wretched. You are blind. You are naked. You are in a hopeless situation the way you are. Oh, yeah, but I can do something for you. If you buy from me gold tried in the fire, and you will be okay. If you put on the eye salve, you will be okay. Oh, what a powerful message the book of Revelation gives us about Jesus Christ. Yeah. I wish I had longer to go through this one because this is a powerful message. I know a person who spent four years doing a PhD on this very subject alone because it is the heart of the book of Revelation to know that you are in good hands when you are being investigated. Hey, that's a powerful thing. Look at the next one. Oh, Jesus' revelations coming king. Wow. Wow. Oh, no, Bill Shorten's not going to solve the problems. Oops, sorry, I shouldn't have said that. 
that's dangerous ground. But, but, but we've become more and more dependent and reliant on people solving our problems. There are scientists out there that can tell us they can fix global warming. Well, I shouldn't show my colours, but I believe it's a lot of hot air. I believe it's a marketing ploy. It's a commercially driven thing. Hey, this is not. Sin is not a commercially driven thing. Sin is a real thing that's destroying this world. And without a coming king, without a coming Christ, it's just going to get worse. We need to know this. And this is what the book of Revelation is about, this coming king. Revelation 19.11. Revelation 19.11. What does it say here? Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. White horse is a symbol of purity. This is the pure one. This is the holy one. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges. See, that's what we just looked at. In righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. That's quoting from chapter 1. This is the Jesus introduced to us in chapter 1. And then if you come down to verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yeah, as we get further through the book of Revelation, we become focused on the subject that Christ is the coming King, and we're giving vivid pictures of the reality of what that will look like. How about this one? Jesus' Revelation's triumphant conqueror. Revelation 7, 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he is who sits on the throne will dwell among them. It takes us to that place where we are delivered in Christ. Revelation 12, 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ has come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before God day and night has been what? Cast down. Who gets the victory? Christ. Christ gets the victory. But do you know what? We get distracted from all of that and we become too focused on the stuff. This has a part to play and that this helps us, the, 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 the story of the seven seals helps us to understand the journey of the Christian church from the time of the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. It travels through the history of the church. Notice it started off with good intentions, but then it goes into a deep decline. The Christian church, but it is saved. It is not lost. It is saved. The seals of the book of Revelation talk or teach us about the demise of the Christian church but not the church of God. The, church, the Christian church that comes out of the time of Christ and takes over. And so the world is all of a sudden presented a false Christian church. And the book of Revelation helps us to understand how to stay true to God. You know, sometimes we get hung up on this stuff. You know, I have more people try and convince me of what this is than of Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation. The only way through this is to know Jesus. Okay? Because this is the false beast. This is the false system. But we get so hung up 
on presenting the negativeness of that message that we lose the positive reality of what the book of Revelation is about. It's about being with the Lamb. This is the counterfeit system. This is the apostasy. This is the falling away. This is the organization that mistreats Christ. This is what happens when you lose the focus of Christ. We are all in danger of that happening in our lives by relegating Christ to something that he is not. We need to honor, we need to exalt Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ because this is going to happen. Armageddon's just around the corner. And there's a lot of people who have a lot of fun with the book of Armageddon. But this is where the false Christ tries to annihilate Jesus Christ forever. But what happens? Revelation 16, 16. It's the final battle, but who gets the victory? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Who's scared of this event? Who's scared of when Armageddon happens? I'll tell you what, you should never be scared. Because when that happens, you know what's happened just before that happens? Is the Lord Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit has sealed you for deliverance. And this will have no impact on those who have stayed true to Jesus Christ. We need to take hold of the key, friends. We need to take hold of the key that unlocks the certainty of our future, Jesus Christ. Have a look at this. It's a bit of a jigsaw puzzle, right? And we all try and put the pieces into place. In the midst of all of this in the book of Revelation is not just the beast. There is his church. There is his people. The one, the bride of Christ, is represented through the book of Revelation. And it's through the bride of Christ that God will help us to make sense of all of this other stuff. But so often we get folk over-focused on the wrong event. We need to be focused on Christ, on his church, and that will protect us from these. We can put the puzzle together. We can put the puzzle together when we understand the book of Revelation. And this is what the servant said to John as he was writing these words and putting them all to paper. In Revelation 22, verse 10, he said, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. What is at hand? The second coming of Christ. He said, the servant said that Jesus would come and every eye would see him. Jesus said, I will come quickly. Everything between that is how we relate to Jesus Christ as the world comes to its end. I just want to, I just pray today that you have got this understanding because I want to show you something. Come to Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And there we've got two texts and then we're wrapping it up. Revelation chapter 7, verse 4. And as we go into Revelation chapter 7, we get to meet God's people who are triumphant. Because Christ is triumphant, and because the book of Revelation presents Christ as being triumphant, triumphant over sin, triumphant over the devil, triumphant over evil, you know what? We become triumphant too. We become triumphant. Because Christ is triumphant, and we have held on, and we continue to believe that Christ is all those things, the natural result of that is we become triumphant. And when you come into the book of Revelation chapter 7, 
you've got a picture of a group of people triumphant. Verse 4, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Come to verse 9, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could number of all the nations, tribes and people and tongue, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches, crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God, one who sits on the throne. Here you've got a picture of a group of people where? Not down here wondering what's going to happen, but up there with God in the presence of his, himself. We become triumphant. Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked and behold a what? A lamb standing on Mount Zion. And with him, these people that have been delivered. The 144,000. I'm not going to go into that today. You've been here long enough. But here we've got a picture of these people delivered. Hey, that's what the book of Revelation is about. Okay? It's about you being delivered. It's about you being given the victory. It's about you being made triumphant. And we are because of Jesus. Because of the lovely Jesus. And I just pray today that you have again fallen in love with the lovely Jesus. Oh, Father, thank you that you spoke through your angels and that you signified your message to John and you endorsed it and you said, this book, this book of Revelation is about my son, the one I gave to the human family, the one who would become a slain lamb. But we thank you in the book of Revelation, we are given a picture of that slain lamb being raised up and seated in glory and then guiding his church, the Christian church, through these stages. And we thank you that it showed us that the ultimate event is the second coming. And that at that time, we will be raised up to be with you, Father. What a beautiful thing that is. Thank you that it's in and through Christ that we are saved. Thank you that it is Christ that is walking amongst his churches. We thank you, Jesus, that you are here with us in our church, guiding us and leading us. And I thank you that you have already promised a triumphant victory to us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for loving us so much that you are willing to guide us and to take us to that place. Thank you that as we deal with the prophecies that relate to the end of time, that we can make sense of all of them as they relate to Jesus Christ. Bless us in our walk with you. May we one day be able to lay our crowns at your feet and sing hosannas and praise your name. Sing that song of Moses and the Lamb because you have given us the victory. We pray this in and through the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.